two, one. Welcome to the third session today of the Hypopara Conference. Uh, this session is Strategies to Prepare for Elective Surgery. Um, it will be presented by Dr. Dr. Daniel Ruan. Dr. Juan is a parathyroid surgeon specialist at the Norman Parathyroid Center in Tampa, Florida. He completed his medical degree from Duke University, surgical training at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and endocrine surgery fellowship at the University of California. Dr. Ruan has been in practice as an endocrine surgeon for over a decade. His current practice is dedicated exclusively to the diagnosis and surgical management of primary hyperparathyroidism. In the highest volume surgical group in the world, Dr. Ruan was previously the Fellowship Program Director of Endocrine Surgery, the Director of Endocrine Oncological Research, and Assistant Professor of Surgery at Brigham and Women's Harvard Medical School. He is a member of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, Parathyroidectomy Guidelines Committee, and the Board of Medical Advisors for the Hypoparathyroidism Association. Dr. Ruan is a former research scholar of the American Cancer Society, fellow in the Pandolfi Cancer Genetics Group at Harvard Medical School, and he is currently the Director of Translational Research at the Norman Parathyroid Center. He is the co-director of the Oakstone Institute Endocrine and Head and Neck Surgery course and has published over 15 textbook chapters and 65 peer-reviewed research articles. Without further ado, welcome Dr. Daniel Ruan. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, can you guys see me now on the screen? Because I don't see myself. You can see me? Yes, oh. we can. You look great. Okay, great. Yes, we can see you. <laughs> well, thanks for that kind introduction. And thank you to Hypopara for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure. I've certainly learned more from the patients at this meeting than they've learned from me. The talk today will be strategies to prepare for elective surgery. And it will, some of it will be relevant for all patients, but uh, a lot of it will be focused on patients with hypopara. We're going to talk about strategies, how to find the right surgeon. Um, we're going to discuss surgical decision making. And some of my prior talks have really focused on this um, entirely. We'll, we'll touch upon it lightly today. You know, how, how do you determine how much surgery to do and when to do surgery? We'll talk about scheduling issues that matter. Um, can the surgery wait? Should it wait now that we're in a pandemic? Um, What's the best day? What's the best time to do elective surgery? We'll talk about communication with nurses and anesthesia and all the caregivers. We'll talk about tips for the day of surgery to make it easier and safer for you. And at the end, there should be enough time to do questions and answers. I think um, I should get through this quickly. There should be 15 or 20 minutes. So putting this talk together, I had to um, sort of reflect on my own experiences recently. I was a patient about it just over a year ago, before the pandemic, where um, it wasn't such a great experience for me. And I reflected on the lessons that I'm giving for, for this talk and did I apply my own advice to myself. The story begins with uh, dinner time. I was eating a Korean dish called kalbi. It's delicious. It's like a, a, a beef uh, rib meal, but instead of having longitudinal bones, they're cut flat. It's very garlicky. You can see there's green onion, it's grilled, it's absolutely delicious. But there's a lot of bones intermittently throughout it. And I bit down not knowing that there was a firm bone underneath and I cracked a tooth. I'd been in Tampa um, not that long, maybe three years, and I'd been to a dentist for routine care and for, for cleanings, but I didn't really have a dentist. So I, I talked to my wife about it and she said that she really liked our pediatric dentist for our sons and that the office was really nice and the people seemed like they were good. Um, I briefly looked them up and saw that the dentist, the adult dentist who owned the practice had an Ivy League degree and, you know, all together I said, okay, well, this sounds like a good place to go. I met with him and he seemed really well put together and he proposed that I get a crown, which as everyone probably knows, you remove the top of the tooth and put a something on top of it, usually made of metal or porcelain. And he said to me, look, you should get this done, not just on the tooth that's cracked, but I don't like the way the other tooth looks on the other side that matches it. I think you should get a crown there too. I didn't question his judgment. I didn't want to, you know, 
make him think that I was disrespectful. Um, we didn't discuss alternatives. We didn't discuss the possibility of maybe just fixing the tooth that was cracked. I agreed to it. So I came in and had the procedure and they, they put a temporary crown on first and nowadays they actually use a 3D printer to put a temporary crown on. And that stayed on for a few weeks. And then when I came in to put a permanent crown on, they basically, I actually didn't see the dentist. I was there for probably an hour and it was on a Friday, Friday afternoon actually, I was very busy. I had office people calling me, maybe a few patients text me. And I think the office there was also pretty busy too on a Friday afternoon. The person who actually took off my temporary crown and put on the new crowns and actually did a little bit of drilling was a technician. And I never thought that a dental technician would be drilling my teeth alone in the room without a dentist. I didn't say anything to him because I didn't want to be disrespectful. I didn't want him to think that, you know, he wasn't good enough or that I didn't trust him. So I was very reluctant to say anything. The dentist did come in eventually. And he did some additional drilling because the, not the tooth that was cracked, but the other tooth, it just didn't sit well. It felt like there was a lot of pressure on it, like it was raised. And after about four or five attempts where the dentist actually drilled down, he seemed a little bit rushed and said, look, this happens. People notice that it seems higher, but it'll, it'll go away with time. I thought nothing of it. By later that night, pretty painful. By the next day, it was really painful. And I asked my wife, who's a surgeon, I said, hey, can you, you know, can you write me for a little something? You know, he wrote me for Tylenol and, or not wrote it, but he told me to take Tylenol and Advil. I said, well, can you give me some maybe like oxycodone or some narcotics just to get me through this? He said, it'd be temporary. And she said, no, that's not the right thing to do, Dan. Um, so I called his office on the weekend and no one answered. There was no, uh, no one there. There was an answering machine that said, if there's emergencies, call the dentist. And so I did, and I got his voicemail. There was no, and it promised to call me back, and there was no callback. I later learned that he was on a cruise. I, when I called his office, when it was later open, I don't think she was supposed to tell me that, but the person who answered the phone said, well, he's, he's somewhere in the Caribbean. He won't be able to get your call. So that weekend, I ended up going to the, a local emergency room. And um, of course, I, I think everyone here has had a similar experience where you have to go to an emergency room and talk to someone at the front desk. I said, look, I, I have a horrible tooth pain and it's after a crown. And she looked at me and said, well, why don't you just call your dentist? I said, well, I can't seem to get in touch with him. And she gave me that look that they give you when they think that maybe you're a narcotics searcher. Um, she looked at me like I was a meth addict. That's why I put that picture there. I got sent to, back to an emergency room, room and uh, I got the same treatment from a medical assistant. I got the same treatment from the nurse. And eventually I met with a doctor, an ER doctor who, you know, he, he had this thick Eastern European accent and said, look, if you really want narcotics, I think you should have a procedure now. And I could tell it was a test. He was saying, well, if you really are in pain and you need this, you should be welcoming me to inject local anesthesia in your mouth. You know, I'm a surgeon. I, I, I didn't play the surgeon card or anything. I said, okay, that will only last a few hours, but I guess if that's the hurdle, I have to jump, I'll do it. And so he did use a very large needle and clearly he wasn't a dentist. He, he injected my mouth in places that didn't relieve any of the pain at all and, um, and then sent me home with the script for oxycodone. It was an absolutely miserable and humiliating experience. And reflecting on that, myself as the patient, how did I select my doctor? When I, and when I say doctor, I mean the dentist. Did we discuss the risks? Did I consider the alternatives? Did I really need that crown for the tooth that wasn't even broken? Did I schedule an ideal day and time? Did I read the consent form? I didn't. Did I ask about delegation? Now that's a strange thing to ask to a dentist. Are you the one who's gonna be doing my procedure? But certainly when I was in that chair and having a technician drill on my tooth, I probably should have spoken up. Um, were the post-op instructions clear? Did I get contact info? We'll talk about 
how to make it so that if you need to talk to your doctor or your surgeon, you know, how can you facilitate that kind of thing? I, I would say overall, I failed and I failed miserably. We require multiple surgeries in our lifetime and in this country about 9.2 surgeries in our lifetime. So this won't be my first experience. I mean, it wasn't my first row really, and it won't be my last. Um, I showed my young son one of my favorite movies recently. Um, young son, he's like 13, but um, the Shawshank Redemption. I thought about that when I was putting the slide together. It's not really redeeming myself by being a better patient next time. I didn't deserve that dentist and no one here who has surgical hypoparic deserved it. Um, and even Andy Dufresne in the movie, you know, I don't think he murdered his wife, but, but still, um, I think I can improve upon that next time and make the experience better for me. And I hope after today's talk, you can take some of these tips and make a better experience for yourself as well. If we break down the elective surgery experience, it can really be broken down into three phases of care. Preoperative is what happens before the day of surgery. I wrote day of surgery, but really, you know, very few people are admitted anymore on the day before their scheduled surgery for things like bowel preps or medical optimization. People typically come in on the day that the surgery is scheduled. And then of course, post-operative meaning, and what I mean is after you leave the hospital. People in this association who have hypopara are pretty sophisticated. And when I talk to people from this organization, they sound like healthcare providers. And I think it's because they've spent so much time in hospitals and in clinics and, and talking to others about their health care. So I don't, I don't want to insult anyone, but I'll let me go through some of these words so that everyone understands what I'm saying. Inpatient means when you're in the hospital, you're admitted to the hospital, you sleep in the hospital, and they're responsible for you. Outpatient is the clinical setting where you come and go, whether it's seeing a doctor in their office, um, getting a procedure in a place where you're not supposed to spend the night. Day surgery is when you come in the day of the procedure, often leaving the same day without spending the night in the hospital. PRN means, per RN, it means not scheduled medications, but medications that you get ordered that you can get as needed for, let's say, pain or tingles if you're feeling hypocalcemic. Enteral means in the gut. So pills that you swallow, for instance, would be enteral. Parenteral means not in the gut, so typically intravenous. An IV catheter is the small tube that they place in, let's say, your hands or your arms to deliver IV fluids or medications. And a central line means a catheter, but the tip of the catheter is in the big veins that typically are in your chest, as opposed to the little veins that you'll see in your hands or your arms. So preoperative phase, how do you pick the right surgeon? Should you do the operation? How do you decide? if it should happen and what procedure you should get. In previous talks, we've really focused on, well, should you have the thyroid operation? Should you have your whole thyroid removed? Can part of your thyroid be removed and get the same outcome? But that's relevant also for other things. Um, my wife recently tore her ACL and the decision was made not to operate. I think it's relevant for hernias. I think it's relevant for, for all kinds of procedures. Scheduling surgery, again, when should it happen? What time of day? what day of the week, can it wait? And communication with anesthesia. So how do you pick the right surgeon? This is an old photo from a talk I gave here before. Um, it's kind of silly, it's just two old guys golfing. They look like doctors. Um, sometimes do doctors refer to their friends, people from their country club, from their social circles? Probably. Um, I think when you get referred by your primary care doctor or a specialist to a surgeon, you should ask them straight up. Why did you choose this doctor? How many patients have you sent to them? What were their outcomes like? A lot of patients say to me, as the surgeon, they'll say, well, if this were your wife, would you do this? I think it's legitimate and a good question to ask your doctor, well, if your family you know, member needed this procedure, would you send them to this person, this surgeon? Um, and I think you can say it in a, in a non-threatening and non-insulting way, because of course, every, you know, if you're aggressive about it, so it can come off the wrong way, but I think these are all legitimate questions. So this is a picture of a place called Harbor Vanguard. It's the building in Kenmore Square in Boston. When I got my first job right out of training, this was about 12 years ago, I was very fortunate. Um, Boston was a very competitive town 
there were more surgeons doing endocrine surgery than really they needed. Um, but I was fortunate that I, I filled in a position in this network where there was only one person doing thyroids and parathyroids, and that was me on my very first day. Um, I had no reputation. I was right out of training. Um, I no track record. And although I, I felt prepared, I'd done a fellowship, and I certainly didn't operate anyone I didn't, you know, that I wouldn't have done to, to myself. But that being said, I got hundreds of referrals in my first year. And it wasn't because I had a great reputation. I was new. It was because that network had to refer to me. Endocrinologists in that department were essentially influenced to, to refer to me. And interestingly, about three years after that job, after I had become friends with many of the endocrinologists and had done hundreds of surgeries, I switched, or the, the hospital I was part of switched affiliations, and I was no longer a preferred provider. So even though I was close friends with several of them, these referring endocrinologists, and you know, and they wanted to refer patients to me, they couldn't anymore. And several of them pulled me aside to say, hey, Dan, um, you, I, I like what you've done for our patients, and I wish I could send my patients to you. But last time I tried, I got an ugly letter from my division chief. I'm getting letters from leadership. So paradoxically, when I really didn't deserve these referrals, I was getting them because of the network. And then when I thought I really deserved them, I, I couldn't get them anymore. And certainly my university practice picked up by then, so it wasn't that big of a deal. But that's how things work sometimes. How about third party websites? So there's a lot of them now. There's Vitals, I think is popular, Health Grades. And then some of these places like US News that does the college rankings and magazine articles, Yelp, which does you know restaurants and other things, they now provide resources for doctor evaluations. And I think that they are useful. You have to look at the totality of evidence, though, not just one review. Um, I'm guilty of leaving uh, reviews that are a little bit flaky. There's a restaurant right down the street here where I live that when I first went there, the food was really good and the service was great. And I wrote them a glowing review. I gave them five stars because it was, you know, it was really, it was really inexpensive and good. But then a year later, things had really changed and, and I had a really bad experience with them and I gave them one star and I wrote, you know, that they treated me badly. It actually was quite offensive. And, and I gave them one star. Pretty flaky. Um, I got uh, one Yelp experienced uh, star reviewer to wrote, who wrote me, you didn't win. You can't change from five stars to one star. Maybe, maybe not. But I think when you look at these websites, you should look at all the reviews and the totality, not just one or two extreme reviews. I looked at myself up recently, putting this talk together, and I came across health grades. Um, a few interesting things. Number one, I'm not an otolaryngologist or an ENT. I'm an endocrine surgeon. Um, and there was one of 17 reviews that was really negative. I, I felt like I was on, you know, reading something from like the Jimmy Kimmel show or the, 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 the uh, mean tweets. Someone wrote incompetent period. I read an article recently that, you know, it means something when you put a period there, but uh, no explanation, just incompetent from Old Orchard Beach, Maine. Hopefully if they're watching this, um, I apologize. Hopefully I can do better for them next time if they come back. Um, Picking the right surgeon, you know, does bedside manner matter? I think it does. And, you know, surgeons, you know, I think about old Norman Rockwell photos of doctors making house calls and being really sweet to their patients. And, and I love those paintings. Um, a lot of people feel like, well, surgeons don't have to be generous and kind. And I, I don't agree with that. I think they're, they're surgeons with good bedside manner who are good surgeons and some that are bad surgeons and vice versa. If you go to a surgeon's clinic and they're arrogant or dismissive, I really think you should find another surgeon. You're going to have to, you know, deal with them if things go wrong. They're going to have to follow up with you and, and, and manage potential side effects and complications. If things, if you don't feel like you have a good relationship with them in the pre-op clinic, I think you should find a new surgeon. So to summarize this, what matters? Well, what do other patients say about the surgeon? What is your doctor's experience with them? The guy who's referring you to that. 
that, that, that surgeon. You can ask the surgeon politely, well, how many have you done? What are your outcomes? And they, sh they should be confident and willing to tell you that and not be offended. And how do they treat you in clinic? What does not matter? Well, I'll tell you, my mom, whenever she finds a new doctor, she makes a point to tell me where that doctor went to med school. And I've told her many times, mom, it doesn't matter. Um, don't trust what their own website says about them. A lot of doctors now have websites. I wouldn't put a lot of weight in that. My mom and others will say, well, that doctor's too young. That doctor's too old. I don't think that matters. And you, if you see any advertisement in a magazine that says top doctor, it doesn't matter. Even that Castle Connolly uh, peer reviewed rankings, I, I don't think it matters at all. In fact, I've known um, surgical leaders who don't even operate anymore, or when they do, they need a junior faculty person to take them through the most simple case to do it for them, and they get rated a top surgeon every year. I don't think it matters. I live in Tampa, and there are these horrible billboards um, up. This is one of them. My sons and I laugh when we see them. This is a plastic surgeon, and he here's a big picture of a woman's chest, and it says, quote, just beautiful exclamation point. And then the quote, if you read the, the name underneath, it's actually his name. Uh, we mockingly say just beautiful in my house. Um, anyway, that's pretty ridiculous. Well, let's transfer topics to the decision to operate. We'll talk about this briefly, not like some of the prior talks I've given here. You got to weigh the potential risks and benefits of surgery in the context of the alternatives. Previous talk of mine, we talked about a mathematical model where you quantitate the benefits of surgery and the chance of cure, and you subtract the cost of complications with the chance of the complication. It reminds me of one of my teachers in San Francisco. One time I was in a clinic with him and he told a patient who was making a very tough decision, look, this is, this is really about math. And I didn't really think about it much then, but I think it's right. I think, I think you can um, do your best to quantitate some of these surgical decisions. And um, I have a picture here with cancer and the hypopara organization symbol that, you know, weighing the risks and benefits for, and I think the model we talked about before was with thyroid cancer. You don't have to remove the entire thyroid or all the lymph nodes every single time. How do you make those decisions? How do you weigh the curing the disease, living better, living longer with the risks, you know, the complications, the potential side effects? Um, can you do a smaller surgery? Can you do surveillance or just watch it? And how can, really how I got involved with this association was with the idea that how can you possibly do a calculation like this for thyroid surgery if you don't have any idea how much it costs to live with a particular complication like hypopara. And I've shown this before here, we presented how surgeons and patients disagree on what are the consequences of living with hypopara. The hypothesis was the perceived impact on quality of life from post-surgical hypopara is significantly lower in surgeons and pre-op patients when compared to patients who live with the condition. We use the SF36 assessment tool that measured you know, things related to quality of life. Um, we used control patients who were given a very detailed consent and detailed explanation of the disease. Um, you know, one page of that questionnaire looked something like this, you know, activities like running, lifting heavy things, participating in sports, all the way down to bending, kneeling over, stooping. You know, how does, how does hypopara affect those activities? And, you know, if you're a surgeon, how do you think that affects your patients if, if they live with that? One of the obstacles was we didn't have a lot of patients with hypopara, so I reached out to Jim Sanders. And Jim Sanders was very protective of the association. I think people should know that he's a man of great honor. He didn't say, yeah, contact everyone here I'll, we'll do whatever you need he said no I, you need to demonstrate that this is important and that this could benefit you know our 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 group and you should be committed to us if you're if we're going to help you and um i have nothing but the utmost respect for jim and uh you know uh, after that experience with him i realized god what a great leader and what a good person um but anyway we gave endocrine surgeons a subset of that questionnaire because you can't really ask surgeons to take a 30 minute thing. They, they won't do it. So it was a little bit shortened for the surgeons, but detailed for the patients. And we ended up with 340 patients with hypopara, all from this association. 
200 control patients, 102 surgeons. And what we found was that the impact of post-operative hypopara on quality of life was dramatically underestimated by surgeons and, and subjects getting a very detailed consultation. It wasn't well received. Many uh, higher impact journals rejected it. And I've before I've, I've showed some of the almost offensive, I wouldn't even say oh, just offensive comments from some of the reviewers um, where they didn't trust what some people were saying about how they lived with it. They didn't trust um, that people were honest about you know how they felt with the with the um, with the complication. But in the end, we did publish it in a lower impact journal. And uh, I think of all the publications I have, this is the one I, I'm probably most proud of. Um, but getting back to this to surgical decision making, you should ask your surgeon, what will you gain from this? What do you expect me to gain from this? Um, and what should I expect regarding pain, recovery, disability? What percentage of patients do you cure? And they should know that. What percentage of patients have complications and what do those complications entail? Dr. Ron, yeah. we have about three, four minutes okay. uh, left before we would like to start the question and answer section. All right, I'll be quick. I'll fly through these last slides. So um, surgical scheduling, it does matter. Be the first case. Um, you don't want to be an afternoon case or an evening case. Um, unfortunately, in some big hospitals, they do um, get elective surgeries pushed back. Um, I think you should tell the scheduler that you need to be either the first or second case of the day. And if they disregard that, say, well, I know you, people do that for diabetics. My case is even more severe because of my hypopara. I can't be done late in the day. It has to be early. You should push for that. Scheduling, does day matter? It does. And if your surgeon tells you that you're likely to be admitted to the hospital after the surgery, you should avoid Fridays. You should, uh, because, you know, your surgeon may not be able to round on the weekend or will have cross coverage. Um, I won't get into whether or not surgeons and healthcare providers perform the same in the operating room on Friday versus uh, earlier in the week, but there are multiple reasons and I think you should avoid Fridays, especially if you're being admitted. Picking the right time, well, a lot of surgeries are elective and it doesn't matter if you wait two months. So you should ask your surgeon, is it urgent? And what will happen if you wait, especially in this time of the pandemic? Um, obviously, we don't know when things will get better, but there's no reason to do an elective surgery in the middle of the pandemic when it can wait. You should ask them what precautions exist at the facility. So are they testing for COVID-19? Are they requiring that of patients or the employees? Do I have to quarantine after my test? Are the staff screened? They use a machine like this at my hospital to make sure anyone with a higher temperature gets pulled out. Will I be sharing space with other patients, whether it's during the admission, like when you check in, is the operating room shared by other patients? In the pre or post-op areas, am I gonna be with other patients? When I go down for scans, will I be sharing rooms with other people and placed in waiting areas with other patients? Will I get a private room after? Will I be in a surgery center or hospital? I think there are pros and cons to each. In the time of the pandemic, actually, I think surgery centers generally have less traffic. And for a lot of procedures, you don't need to be admitted and you don't have to have instant access to specialists if something, let's say, goes wrong. I would say discuss that with your surgeon. When you communicate with anesthesia, usually the pre-op charts are done by, the, by someone who's not your doctor, or not your anesthesiologist. So use your surgeon to facilitate direct communication with the anesthesiologist who will be doing your case. So tell them, I'm not a normal patient. I have special needs with my calcium and you need to communicate that with the anesthesiologist. Bring your own meds. Now, that's, this is a controversial thing because certainly a lot of hospitals don't want you taking meds and getting it confused with the inpatient meds they sign for you. But let's face it, you're not going to take too much calcium if you know your tells better than the doctors and nurses do. If you're feeling tingles, numbness, cramping, you can take calcium pills if they're not providing it to you, if they're not giving it to you promptly. Um, you should check beforehand whether or not they have Natpara, Rocaltrol in stock and that kind of thing. Surgical consent, I'll get through this quickly, don't use students, the doctor who's the attending doing the surgeon should, should be doing it. Don't just bleed for a, don't just settle for a generic, well, bleeding and infections are the risk. No, you should talk to the surgeon about the specific risks. Um, if you're NPO after midnight, it's still okay to take your calcium rocaltrol before the surgery. My recommendation is that you grind it up and that you put it in a sip of water. 
Um, IV access is very important because if you take someone who has a little catheter in their wrist or their hand and you infuse calcium, let's say you're having symptoms after gut surgery and you can't take your pills by mouth, that can cause what we call necrosis or destruction of tissues where the IV leaks. So make sure that you get central venous access if you anticipate that you're not going to be able to take your pills afterward. And that central access could be through a access point in your arm or your hands, but it'll have to be threaded up. Usually it's done by a special nurse and has to be arranged beforehand. Teach your nurses what your hypocalcemia tells are. I wouldn't give nurses papers. I, I think uh, several times I've seen that it usually doesn't go over well, um, but arrange for your doctors to give PRN, PRN orders, meaning as needed for both calcium checks and calcium pills. Don't count on not having that set up and then in the middle of the night asking a nurse, hey, can you can you call the doctor and arrange for me to have extra calcium? Your IV fluids should have calcium in them. Um, and how often your calciums are checked depends on how long the surgery is, how much blood is lost or, you know, or, or, or fluids are lost during the surgery. Have that discussion with the anesthesiologist before. And I would basically emphasize to get it, even if it's a short procedure, to get it checked, you know, uh, either during or immediately following the surgery. Um, students and residents, you should be upfront with your surgeon about their participation. Um, a lot of people complain that doctors don't know much about hypopara. Well, here's your chance. You can teach them firsthand. Usually students are the ones that can spend the most time with you at the bedside, and you can play a big role in them learning about this. In the post-operative period, who can you call? Ask your surgeon for their cell phone. I don't think that's intrusive or offensive. Let them know, look, I don't plan on calling you unless there's an emergency. Can I call you directly? As opposed to like what I did, calling an office number or you know, having a pager go through an intern. Um, I would say, generally speaking, home is always better than the hospital, especially during the pandemic, if you can get home quicker. Um, and I found that a lot of patients who have permanent complications like hypopara, a lot of the time they tell me that they didn't talk to their surgeon about it. Well, gosh, you should provide feedback to your surgeon, both positive and negative, but certainly negative, and let them know. In summary, I hope this is close to the time you were hoping. In summary, carefully, I was very quick there. Carefully select your surgeon, schedule early in the day, early in the week if you can. Communicate your needs um, pre-op. IV access is very important. If you're an inpatient, establish a plan with your surgeon regarding calcium checks and getting these PRN orders, meaning having calcium checks and calcium uh, you know, supplements lined up for you where you can just tell the nurse, I need them now. Um, bring a typed list of your meds. Don't just tell them verbally. Um, show up with a typed list so that there's no confusion and uh, and leave online feedback for your surgeons. Many thanks. People write down this number in this email if you have any other questions after today. Many thanks. Um, thank you, Dr. Ron. OK, our first question is in preparing for a colonoscopy as a hypoparathyroid patient, um, how to keep calcium um, and other things balanced during the bowel prep? Right. And um, any uh, way to make sure that the team that is doing the colonoscopy is prepared for your HPTH and what can happen because of that? Absolutely. So basically you're forcing diarrhea upon someone and malabsorption um, with a bowel prep. So I don't think it's unreasonable to have a plan that may even involve having access to emergency care or even being admitted for a bowel prep, especially for patients who, I don't know if this is the right word, but sort of fragile hypopara, where it's very easy for them to get into tetany and other problems. I don't think it's out of the question to admit someone to do uh, bowel prep and also administer calcium potentially intravenously as needed. Um, you certainly will need to, you know, generally speaking, you need to take extra calcium. Um, and I don't think it's unreasonable. Let's say if you tell your gastroenterologist, look, I have hypopara. I anticipate problems. Can we schedule a calcium check no matter what, you know, the night of and the day after, you know, my, my bowel prep and even when I when I arrive, I think that's completely reasonable and doable and doable. Do you think it is a good idea along those same lines to not only inform the gastroenterologist, but the um, anesthesiologist that will be assisting with the procedure? Absolutely. Um, 
and, and I defer to you know some of the endocrinologists who will be participating today, but I would say it's completely uh, legit to tell the anesthesiologist who's doing your, let's say, twilight anesthesia with intravenous um, propofol to say, look, I need you to check my calcium now before we start, and I need you to check it after the procedure as well. I don't think that's, uh, they're, they're gonna place an IV in you anyway, they could check a serum calcium level without you know any additional sticks or problems. So, you mentioned um, if you're not getting a good response when searching for a surgeon, um, how do you go about finding a better option? Yeah, you know, obviously that depends upon where you live. Um, some people in some parts of the country have less access. Um, for and in my and my practice certainly is is international, um, but it's not easy for some people to get minor procedures who are in more remote areas. Um, I would say that you can use online resources, and sometimes if it ends up being out of network, you can often work with your insurance company and say, "Look, I live in Trenton, Missouri, and I need to go to Kansas City. Um, I found this doctor, and I spoke with them in their office, and they're willing to treat me." Um, you can make your case with your insurance company to, to go out of network and for them to pay for it. It just requires usually some extra work in terms of letters and phone calls. Okay, and the next question asks, um, when you ask a surgeon for um, if they've done a lot of surgeries and they just answer, oh yeah, he's done a lot, but they never give you a specific amount. Yeah. What is, is there a better way to phrase that, I guess? If you're meeting with your surgeon and, and you say it earnestly without, I mean, I think before I joined my current group, I got that question every now and then. And I think there's a way to do it that's less, um, that's really not offensive. I think if you show that you're concerned and you're anxious, say, look, um, can you can you talk to me about, about how many of these you do and, and what the outcomes are? I, I don't think that would ever offend. And if, but getting, I think, more specific into the question, if you, if they're not answering clearly and confidently, I think you find another surgeon. It means they don't, you know, they should say, look, I do a, I do 500 of these a year. I've done over 5,000 in my career. My outcomes are excellent, and this is what happens. I if they, if they can't provide that for you, you can find another surgeon. Okay. Give me one second. I'm reading. Some of these questions are really long. They all seem to be related to bowel prep and colonoscopies. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because um, you do, you lose a lot of calcium during the prep. Endoscopy is now part of, you know, routine maintenance care. So everyone is, is getting them now. And yeah, I understand that. Would it be inappropriate to ask to have your procedure, such as a GI scope or colonoscopy, at a particular facility? Because this one says the place that she had it did not have IV calcium and then had to be transported by ambulance to the hospital. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I find that hard to believe that there's an endoscopy center that doesn't have the ability to give calcium because they have certainly IV fluids. Um, maybe it's not in the formulary to give calcium IV. That's certainly something they could ask beforehand. And absolutely, um, I, I think that's that's an important you know thing to do if, if someone is in tetany and recover after a horrible bowel prep <laughs> um, that they're they're able to give intravenous calcium through a central line. And that in that central line could be a pick. It doesn't have to be in the neck or the or the chest. Well, it can be through the hand. You know what I mean? But hypopara patients aren't easy. Um, they deserve what is is there a recommended ball product for ball prep that uh, for colonoscopy for hypopara patients that would make it safer? I'm not aware of um, go lightly or you know others being better or worse for calcium absorption, but I'll certainly ask, you know, my colleagues and I can post that later, but I, I, I'm not aware that one is far superior in terms of calcium absorption. Is, is there an appropriate way, in your opinion, as a physician to address fellow physicians when sharing your concerns about them not following standards of care for hypoparathyroid without offending them? Yeah. Yeah, I, in my own personal experience with this dentist, I think it's very difficult to address a doctor when you feel like they've done something wrong or aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, 
but you can have an earnest conversation. And if they're the one who's unprofessional and, and says, look, you know, your concerns aren't valid or what you're saying is not true, even though you know it is, I think you can find another doctor. And I certainly wouldn't argue with a doctor over making bad decisions, but I, I think you can certainly make your case and say, look, um, you know, I think that after a bowel prep, I should have my calcium level checked. And if they disagree with that, um, after an earnest conversation and there's no door open, then I think you cancel the endoscopy and go somewhere else. Good point. Um, this patient says they are scheduled to have spine surgery soon and they expect to be in the hospital one to two nights. It is very difficult to explain to hospital personnel that they take not para and that there is no substitute and why they need to bring it to the hospital. Right. Um, can you suggest a way to explain to the surgeon and the team at the hospital? Well, you should meet the surgeon before the procedure and can express your concern. And now some ortho and spine and, and, and uh, neurosurgeons don't really want to get involved in the nuance of endocrine care. But at the very least, you can get a direct line to the anesthesia team and then and have that discussion before you come in. I don't think it's appropriate or, or you know, ideal to just show up with Nat Para in a in a uh, in a cooler and say, oh, "Look, I'm I'm this special patient." I think you should have that discussion with the surgeon and ask that surgeon to to go directly to the to the to give you direct access to the anesthesia team before. You know, a lot of the time when people are having elective surgeries, it's a nurse or a student or a resident who's doing the preoperative screening from the anesthesia side. But there's always a mechanism where the surgeon can call the anesthesiology team and, and talk to them directly and, and put you in contact with them to talk about advanced issues, whether it's cardiac or hypopara. Okay. Um, Don't just show up on the day of surgery with Nat Para in your cooler and expect everyone to be on board. I think that's too late. No, I think that's good advice. I think don't just show up on the day of surgery and and dump all even all of this information on them. It's something that you should discuss preoperatively. And you know, I I think um, there are Rocaltrol is in most formularies. Most hospitals have that. Most you know, so I, that's also something. You know, not that Rocaltrol is an acute drug or anything, but certainly someone had brought up that uh, a facility didn't have the ability to give calcium IV. Those things can be clarified before, really. Okay. This one says, why don't you like afternoon surgeries? Um, does it have anything to do with fatigue level of the physician? You know, I, that's controversial. I won't get into that so much, but I will say this. It's very frustrating as a surgeon when your case goes late and then there's a team switch where maybe your nurses are not used to doing endocrine cases in my case or it could be spine or whatever you end up with the night team that does trauma um you know it's it's not just the surgeon fatigue it's all the other things as well you know maybe you'll get put in a room that's not really used for that elective surgery normally because the staffing is different late in the day than it is early in the day um i can't think of a single circumstance where it's ideal to do the surgery late as opposed to early and because of people who have endocrine issues, whether they're diabetic or hypopara, I think though you should make a strong case to be done early with no exception. And if you find yourself, which has happened to me before, where they say, look, doctor, your room is needed for something else, or there's some horrible delay, you know, you're going to be doing your elective surgery at five o'clock at night. I think that's the time to say no. And even if you're, you know, as a patient, I think you should re reject that as well. Okay. This one says, do you think anesthesia negatively affects hypopara? Hmm. I don't know exactly what they mean. Certainly, if you over resuscitate someone, let's say without calcium in the IV fluids, yeah, you can make someone horribly hypocalcemic in, in, in tetany. Um, so yeah, anesthesia and the physiologic parameters that they control can certainly influence um, your serum calcium level and maybe even you know how your drugs work after. So I think the answer is yes. Okay. And then we're going to end this with, um, we have a compliment on here that says, OMG, this guy is amazing. These stories and his level of vulnerability in his stories were great. Love him. That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> but thank you very much, to, uh, Dr. Ruan, for your time. And um, any additional questions that did not get answered, folks, we will get the answers for you and get them published to the website. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invite.